of suspicion for black people? Does color make you a target? How would you like it if every time you left your house, you were asked, where are you coming from? Where are you going? What are you doing in the area? Well, I've been told everything uh, from the fact that I fit the description of a robbery suspect to I was making noise and um, some of the tenants in the area called the police on me. I got pulled over just for no reason. I didn't cause any trouble. I didn't hurt anybody. I was just on my way home from school. That was it. I'll just be driving down. The cops pull me over. First thing they say, um, do you speak English? You know? And it's, it's, it, of course I do. You know, I'm an American citizen like everybody else. So it's horrible. There's bad incidents, like a Rodney King incident, you know, is, is a terrible tragedy. But if there's not much you can do about it. As far as minorities, you know, you have a more, more of a negativity outlook as far as the police, you know, police department looking at it as like a minority has been ne negative. I'm Mexican myself, and I know some of my relatives have been pulled over and just treated, they're cautious. You know, cops are people too. I believe that I'm being stopped unconstitutionally because I'm a black teenager in the city of Beverly Hills. Audrey, that young man that we just heard from on the videotape was your grandson. That's my grandson. And that's part of the reason why you're, you're here today. You're uh, part of a lawsuit against the city of Beverly Hills. That's correct. Why is he suing? Well, Beverly Hills has a nasty little secret. It's called the land of the beautiful people. The rich and the famous live there. But what many people don't know is that there's a nasty little secret. There's racism running blatant in Beverly Hills. That's what we're here to discuss today, both sides of that issue. Let me introduce our guests. We're joined by Audrey, two women on the stage today who know what it's like to live in the predominantly white community of Beverly Hills. Brenda Mack, and that was Audrey Bowen that we were talking to, say that they and their families have experienced racism under the guise of law enforcement. You'll also meet the former mayor of Beverly Hills, who says it's the custom, policy, and practice of the Beverly Hills Police Department to detain black pedestrians and motorists. And we're joined by former Los Angeles Police Chief Daryl Gates, who says police officers are merely trying to do their jobs. Please welcome everybody to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Audrey, let's finish up with this experience with your son. Now, d what did he do? Did he do anything wrong? He was doing nothing but driving the streets of Beverly Hills. His color was black. That's all he did. And he was stopped and pulled over under suspicion for a crime? What did the he police tell him? He was told um, that there was a crime in the area. He was told his brake light was out after having the lights checked. That was not true. He was pulled over many times when he asked, what did I do wrong? He was given absolutely no explanation. Your grandson has been stopped over 20 times? Over 20 times. He's only been, he's been driving less than two years. And one of those times stopped in his own driveway at home? Once he was coming out of the, um, the driveway at home, and he saw the policeman circle the, the area and stop as he arrived at the street, they ask him, where are you going? Where do you live? What are you doing here? And he said, uh, I live here. I'm going home. I parked my car. I'm going home. And they said, well, what is the address? What's the name of this cross street? He said, officer, have I done something wrong? If I've done anything wrong, I'd like you to tell me. They didn't answer him about that at all. They simply said, answer my question. How have you noticed that these experiences have affected him? He's apprehensive. He stopped driving for a period of almost six months because he was afraid that he would be stopped. So he just simply refused to drive for quite a period of time. Brenda, I would suspect that none of this surprises you. No, I used to work in law enforcement. And in the late 60s and 70s, there was a thing that you didn't let the dark catch you in Glendale. And in Beverly Hills, you knew that you were going to be stopped. Now, it was four men mostly. I mean, it was just an understated thing. But I didn't know that it applied to women until I moved to Beverly Hills. And I want to say that I am a firm supporter of law support because there's a lot of crime out there. And when you're in law enforcement, you know when you hit the street that anybody could be your enemy. It could be a kid. It could be an adult. You don't know who the enemy is. And I, I hate it. We always called it we versus they. And it really is a we versus they because there's crime going on every second. Your adrenaline is running. Your life is on the line. 
But when I moved into Beverly Hills, I had to file a lawsuit just to move in. When I went for the apartment, I had to dress up. I couldn't wear sweats or anything. I had to dress up, look good, have all the qualifications. So 15 minutes after I left for the apartment, uh, the guy left a, a message for me that uh, the apartment had been taken. So having integrated the Oakwood apartments earlier, I called up FEPC and they sent a white girl out in blue jeans and sweatshirt and she was offered the apartment immediately within minutes. So I filed a suit and moved in. And uh, when I got in, every day when I would go for my afternoon walk, well, evening walk, I should say, I'd walk all down to Rodeo Drive and everywhere. Ran into Fred Astaire. He had no escort. But every night when I went out, a Beverly Hills police car would follow me. And they'd, wherever I went, they would go. And so one night, I went up to the car and I said, you know, I want to tell you that I really feel good about this, that I have security with all the robberies and stuff going on. <laughs> Thank you for this extra protection that I'm getting. Bob, let me turn to you now. You actually are representing the lawsuit with uh, Audrey's grandson and others who basically, among other things, have said that it's, it's pretty tough to drive through Beverly Hills and not be stopped or, or detained, harassed by the police. Is the, you're a one-time mayor of Beverly Hills. Is there a policy, even if it's an unspoken one, to harass African Americans? Well, that's the nature of what our suit is about. And uh, the fact is, when I was mayor, I went on two occasions. I served in the city council for eight years. And during that time, worked in, uh, very, very hard on the whole issue of interracial harmony. Uh, only last year, when I have been out now for about two years out of office, last year I was confronted with the shocking realization of overwhelming circumstances that led, in fact, to this lawsuit. So uh, that's Overwhelming where circumstances. So is the answer to the question yes? The answer to the question is the allegations in our suit, which we're prepared to litigate, allege a practice and custom. Daryl Gates, I, I can only assume that your point of view is contrary to what Bob has just said. Well, I, I, can't, I can't afford to live in Beverly Hills. I don't live in Beverly Hills. I can't even afford to drive through Beverly Hills. But <laughs> I, I, know, I know the chief. I know uh, the, many of the police officers out there, and I think they do a fine job. Beverly Hills is probably one of the heavily, heavy, most heavily policed uh, 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 cities that you'll find in the country. I've got a lot of police officers out but the, there. But the people... They've got to have something to do. People, there tends to be a, a feeling that... Well, no, that's, a, that's an important statement. Well, that's true. It's, it's an it, important statement because... What do you mean? There's no crime in Beverly Hills? No, well, there is crime, but, but they, they probably make more stops per officer. They probably do a lot of but things... But are they stopping that, that more black can't... people just because they, they can? Just because... Are they... Are they I, I have a feel. I, I have any idea. Why are why are more blacks stopped than whites? Well, the crime, quite frankly, is an awful lot of black crime. If you in the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> well, in the city. Well, let's wait. let him finish, and then I'll give you a chance wait, to now, respond. There, there is a, an awful lot of black crime. If you in the city of Los Angeles, for example, if if you are black, the op, the chances of being murdered in the city of Los Angeles are far greater than if you're white. About 12% uh, of the murders are white, 45% uh, are black, and 43% are, are Hispanic. To simplify so, this, you're saying there are more black suspects, so if the suspect percentage is greater, the percentage of people being stopped over in that faction of the population will be greater. That's correct. Does that make sense to you? Not at all. And also, as far as your data is concerned, when it, when it, when it comes to Beverly Hills, as, as far as your data about the percentages of crime, if there is no crime in Beverly Hills, then why are these police officers there oh, I, in the I didn't first say there wasn't any crime. I, I have no idea. I haven't looked at the statistics. Oh, you so have I, statistics I for everything from, else but I'm not, not Beverly, Beverly Hills, Hills statistics. I'm just saying it's okay. a heavily police I have no idea. We'll get into this further today. We're going to meet people who say that they were stopped, they were questioned, they were detained, and they feel for no other reason than the color of their skin. We're going to hear from parents who say that they fear for their children's safety and not because of muggers, because of thieves, it's dangerous out there, but because they're concerned about the police. The question really is, what is the job of law enforcement in our country? The cops, of course, say their job is to keep the peace, but many blacks say it's to humiliate and keep minorities in line. Double standard. Blacks under suspicion, that's the focus of our show today. Hope you'll come on back and talk with us. We're talking with people who
who say that in many affluent communities all across the country, the police single out African-American males. In 1988, actor LeVar Burton was stopped in his BMW near San Jose, California. He was surrounded by narcotics police demanding an ID. For one reason, he says, I was young and black. On stage today, we're joined by people who say they feel victimized by police just because they're black and also to give a police officer's perspective is former Los Angeles Police Chief Daryl Gates. want to check in with you guys before we continue. Yes. Hi, to Daryl Gates. I just want to know, where are you getting your percentage, percentage about black people being in, you know, there's more black crime? Where are you, where are you getting that from? No, I, I don't understand that. that. You know, what about the white people that are committing the crime and the Hispanics? You always focus on black. No, Everything like you say answer. is black. I'd like to answer that one. That's you one know, of the and things. I'm proud of you. No, you're no, we're not woman. yet. You're not. You're wait, that's woman. one of the things that we as blacks must try to avoid is denial. I always say denial is not just a river in Egypt. We do have high crime. Okay? We have it. Now, the difference is where I beg to differ is like LeVar Burton and other people that are stopped by the police. They don't seem to have the common sense to know who's trying to commit a crime and who isn't. Now, if I'm driving around in a Bentley or a Rolls Royce, and I'm dressed and I'm in diamonds and stuff, I'm not trying to commit a crime. And that's well, now where that's, we did. That's not necessarily true, though, is it? I mean, isn't that kind of an oversimplification, too? It might be an oversimplification, but that seems to be what is going on. And then proportionately, when we start talking about proportionately, the city of L.A. has put out a lot of money for lawsuits where black men have been suffocated in their living rooms or in their, in their bedrooms when it was the wrong house. Okay? Well, let me, let me then introduce my next guest to you. Back in 1991, this man was on his way to pick up a date, uh, but he ended up strip-searched, threatened, beaten, and arrested. Please welcome Arthur Colbert to the show. Thank you. <laughs> have you been backstage listening to this conversation? Yes, yes, I have. And there's one thing I'd like to say um, before I tell you a little bit about what happened to me. Uh, I'll jump around to the end of what happened and what's still going on in Philadelphia. Now, Mr. Gates mentioned that there is more black crime. Well, there are more black people being put into prison wrongly. What happened... What happened in Philadelphia, and I'm, I'm not sure if you are aware of the situation, Mr. Gates, but there are 45 people that have already been let out of prison, and these people were wrongly put into prison by corrupt officers. I could have easily been put into prison, but I decided not to be a victim of people and attitudes such as yourself, sir. I, I don't know what attitude you're talking about. I wasn't the chief in Philadelphia when this was going on, Willie Williams. No, right? no, no, no. But uh, let me just say, let me just say that you, know, I, you, you brought up a point I think is very important, that there isn't any way for a police officer to look at an individual and say that's a criminal or that's not a cr criminal. There's no way for them to do that. But I wish there was. I wish there was a... In a Rose Royce I, and and we hear it all the crime. time. We hear it all the time. Why did you stop me? I'm not a criminal. I'm a, I'm a good citizen. Well... How do you know? And if you are a good citizen and you were stopped by the police, why don't you just say, hey, uh, I, 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 I don't know what I did, but I want to cooperate. Well, when you, let's get to your story, Arthur. Right? When you were stopped by the police, okay. how did you conduct yourself and how did they okay. handle you? First of all, I never had a criminal record. Uh, I was not uh, usually in a position where I was stopped by the police in the manner that I was stopped in Philadelphia. What happened? was I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. The police officers came to me. They asked me where I was going. And as I began to tell them, they started searching my car, started searching me. They started to be very intimidating. So I knew, well, these guys have guns. I don't have any guns on me, so I better just be cool and let things go the way they need to go. Now, what happened to me was um, I went to the place. I was on the wrong street. I didn't know where I was. Uh, as I came out, the police approached me. They told uh, the person I was with to go back home. Then they started to question me. At the time, I was a Temple uh, student at Temple University. I was um, uh, working at uh, an insurance company. I had ID and everything to prove this, but they denied everything that I produced for them. Now, what happened, to kind of make a long story short, was that, well, it, it was a three-hour episode of them harassing me. They took me inside of a drug house, beat me around, choked me, pulled the gun out of me, pulled the hammer back, told me they were going to kill me, did a countdown, five, four, three, 
two, one. Now, if I did that to you, what would you think? Well, oh, because I'm black, you'd be scared. But if I was white, you'd like it, right? No, I mean, I'm not trying to make now, light of Now, what were they accusing you of when you were saying, what have I done? Why are you doing this? What was their response? What was their response while they were doing that to me? Right. Um, well, they were trying to intimidate me, and they were trying to get me to react to them so that they could have something against me. They, you think they were trying to harass you into some sort of aggression so then they could say that you had started it, basically. That's correct. Now, that's but now they must have said, we have a suspect that fits your description, there's no, 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 a drug no, no, deal no, no, gone no, down. They no, didn't no. offer any explanation. Let me, let me give you a little history of what's been going on. I don't mean to be naive here, but yeah, I'm just trying to get These some... officers were known as the Five Squad. They had been doing these things for 10 years. My case, the 23rd case that happened to uh, blow the whistle on these guys, and it was their career to basically be corrupt. Arthur's experience led to the conviction of six officers in Philadelphia, and after that, like 45 to 50 people were let out of jail because of, they were incarcerated right. by those individuals, right. and right. the evidence was either obtained illegally, inadmissible, or was framed, etc. Later on the program, you're going to meet this radio and television personality who says that blacks have to stop crying racism every time they're pulled over. But next, you'll hear about a young man who may have been killed by police just because he was driving an expensive car. We'll talk more right after this. Do police treat blacks and whites differently? Back in 1989, a Los Angeles cop stopped actor Blair Underwood, who was then 25, and pulled a gun on him. It inspired an L.A. law episode. Blair said about the incident, quote, We have all, at one time or another, been stopped by the police and harassed. Because you drive a half-decent car and you're young, it's assumed that it's drug-related or you must be a gang member or drug dealer, end quote. Okay, audience, let's hear it. Have you had that experience? Do you think that kind of thing happens? Yes. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Gates. He made the comment about that uh, when you're black, when the officers are on the street, and they don't, they have no way of knowing uh, if a black person is a criminal or not. And you, and then you went back and said uh, said earlier that you know that your officers are not trained for that. So are you saying that they're trained that they know that a white person is a criminal or not? And wasn't just referring to black people. I was referring to anyone that they stop. And they do stop a lot of uh, white people, a lot of uh, Hispanics, a lot of uh, Asians. Uh, they stop people that they believe are involved in crime. And that's the reason they stop them. But there isn't any way to identify a person and know that that person is a criminal or is not a criminal. There's no way to do it. I wish there was. Well, what about Arthur's case where he was stopped? And, you know, he was on his way to pick up a date, but he was lost and he was on a street where there was a crack house or something. Am I right so far, Arthur? That's correct. So you can understand, all right, he was stopped. But then what about the way he was treated and provoked? In, in his case? Yeah. Well, his case, uh, the officers are bad cops. Uh, they've been prosecuted. So you're saying it's an isolated case. Not, you I'm can't nail the whole police the department, department for that. Let me just say, I'm not defending bad police work. I'm not defending bad cops. We have them. We have racist cops. I will admit that. But what I'm saying is... What I'm saying is... It's about time you admitted that. She gave, you've never had said that. I've never heard you say no, that. I've, I've said it many times. No, I've disciplined them. I've, I've fired them. But what I'm saying is the vast majority of police officers are good police officers doing a job for you, trying desperately to deal with the crime and the violence in this community. The police department handles all their problems. There are racist cops there. But to this lady back here who's making it sound like there are no black crimes, I work in the community. I work at evening. I see what comes out at night. There are lots of crimes. They're committed by whites, Asians, blacks, all kinds of minorities. You cannot sit there and be blind and say that there are no black crimes. There are a lot of black crimes. Every time our store has been robbed or any other store in this chain, it has been by black people. There have been by Asian people. It has been by white people. You cannot sit there and totally be blind and say, there are no black crimes. Can I say something to piggyback on what you said? I didn't say it would be all yeah. black people. You didn't listen, then, Arthur. Well, uh, just to piggyback on what you said, um, it's, when we go into communities, you know, the myth about land of the, uh, home of the free, land, land of the brave, I think I'm saying that right, but it's a, it's a joke because of the fact that it's the free people are controlling the people who are trying to get a little bit of freedom, and it's just like in Beverly Hills, you say there's so many cops, but then um, a black person gets stopped, and I know Jerry, and um, I know what happened to him, and that's ridiculous. 
because of the fact that uh, he's a black person and they want to patrol and find out, well, what is he doing in this neighborhood and blah, blah, blah. I mean, Let me bring up another example and, uh, that you probably all know about. A recent case that drew a lot of national attention was when the police department in Brentwood, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Pittsburgh, was charged with involuntary manslaughter in the death of Johnny Gamage after he was stopped by police one night. Now, his autopsy revealed that apparently a cop's knee and baton pressed against his back and neck, suffocated, and killed him. With us today, we have Johnny's mother, Narv Scamage. I'm very sorry for your loss, and thank you for being here. <laughs> Ms. Scamage, as far as you know, what do you believe happened with your son that night? Uh, you know, we wasn't there, and we can only go about what we heard, but what I believe... And I know Johnny, he had never been in any, any trouble, had any problem with the law. Uh, that night he was coming home and cops apparently was behind him. And knowing Johnny, if he, they said erratic driving, knowing him if a cop was behind him and maybe he hit the brakes. And as he proceeded on, the cops continued to follow him. So I think he maybe hit the brakes again and maybe even changed lanes because he know he hadn't done anything to let the cop go around him. But after the cops didn't go around him, he pulled back in the lane in front of the cops and then they pulled him to the side of the road. And the cop, the one that started out with the traffic stop, mere traffic stop, he had, when they stopped Johnny from what we heard, he got out of the car to go back to the cop, and the cop ordered him back in the car. So he got back in the car, and I guess he had called for backup cops to come, and this one, this other cop came in named Voltage. Now, why, why would they call for backup unless your son had a weapon or was somehow threatening the police officer? Isn't that unusual? No, it is they called for backup because it was a black man. Right. A black man, literally. I think it goes back to slave days when black men seem to represent some kind of threat. And I think Arthur said it here when he said that he didn't try to approach the cops or do anything because, like, if you notice with Rodney King, when they were beating him, at no time did he try to grab the batons. He just tried to protect himself because black males are taught you do not go out there and get confrontational. Well, Daryl Gates, you say that you don't think the batons are a good idea. I think they're a bad idea. I always have thought they were a bad idea, and I tried desperately to get uh, my city council or my board of police commissioners not to approve the baton. Think about it. It's a prehistoric weapon. It's a club. And that's what we give our police officers to protect themselves and to take people in, into custody. It's a horrible thing. But what would you suggest instead of the baton? Uh, well, I, I like pepper spray and I like, and quite frankly, uh, I think uh, there are upper body control holds that are good and can be used and have been used for years and with no problems but whatsoever. But here's a case where it may be that an officer who had Johnny Gamage on the ground with his knee against his back may have with his physical body, yeah. suffocated this and, young man. And that's very poor procedure. You can't, can't put a baton or anything else on the front part of the neck. That is totally inappropriate. I, I want to talk more about, about your case. Uh, but, but your daughter is in the audience today. I want to know, first of all, how this, how this affects a family. And, um, and because uh, Johnny was best friends with his cousin, Ray Seals, who has celebrity status with the Pittsburgh Steelers, does this give your case mo more notoriety? Do you feel you would not be getting this kind of attention and investigation otherwise? Also, you're going to meet this radio and television personality who says that he's sick and tired of kids crying racism every time they have a run-in with the law. He's next. Some controversial tips on, he says, how you can handle the cops. We'll be right back. And let me just say this, too. It's just not white cops. It's black cops, too. Let's talk about everybody. We're talking about whether or not police officers view blacks with more suspicion than they do whites. Uh, what we know for sure is that Narv Scamage lost her son and Pamela lost her brother, Johnny. When you go through an experience like this, how has it affected your family and, and has it changed your perception of the police and, and who they are? Um, yes, uh, as far as perception of the police, we've learned not to trust them. Uh, um, we was always taught to trust police officers. They was here to protect and serve, not to kill someone after a 15-minute um, traffic stop. Your, your brother has been described as not the kind of guy who would get into trouble. Never. 
how has it affected you? How are you and your mom coping? Um, really, we're just out here letting people know that there are bad cops and it needs to stop. And it has to stop because Johnny, my brother Johnny, does not, he shouldn't be dead right now. After a traffic stop, 147, 201, he's dead because he's driving a Jag. It shouldn't have happened. Which was Ray Seals' Jag. Ray Seals' Jag. Yeah. Your cousin and Johnny's best friend is Ray Seals, of course, the defensive end for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, we have a picture of him putting a very touching photo, putting his football jersey in Johnny's casket. And as you say, you're here to get out a message. He, too, has been very vocal about this tragedy. Here's a clip of what he's had to say. Well, uh, I can describe Johnny best. Uh, me and him, we've been, he's my cousin. We've been best friends since uh, growing up. Absolute good brother, all about uh, charity work, wanting to do for communities, and uh, just everybody who's come across here in the Pittsburgh area, they, they learn to love him. And uh, for this to happen to him is just like a, uh, it's unbelievable. But the thing that really upsets me about it is, is the fact that uh, the cops in this area, they show no remorse for what's, what's been done. Let me offer another point of view as we further our discussion. My next guest said that people would be fools not to admit that police view blacks with more suspicion than whites, since he says that blacks commit a far greater number of crimes. Please welcome radio and television personality and the host of The Right Side, Armstrong Williams. All right. You have what I guess could be a, a, a very controversial point of view on this. What are you saying, that, that, that members of the African-American com community are whining about it, hiding behind racism? What is it? You know, I would never minimize the pain of those people who spoke today, who were brutalized by a police force when you were taught to respect police and see them as role models. I mean, I am not going to sit here today and judge a group of people. But those individuals experienced that, and I want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. And that was wrong. And I don't think there should ever be an excuse for a police officer to hit anybody. Because they should be the example. <laughs> they should be the role model. And that is wrong. And it, it upsets me. But it's also wrong that we also have to admit that blacks commit crimes. But they don't commit crimes because they are black. They commit crimes, people commit crimes because they feel nobody cares about them. They have no opportunity. I sat in the green room and listened to Daryl Gates talk about how they protect the neighborhoods of the rich. What does that say to the people who don't have? Is it their fault? Everybody needs protection. I mean, what kind, what kind of message does that send when you can sit here and say you can protect someone that doesn't need protection? But however, there is a disproportionate number of blacks that commit crime, and their parents and the community has a responsibility to address that, to say that it is wrong. My father taught me, when I was a child, that so life is not fair. My father taught me that if a police officer stops me, take a position of humility, a powerless position. Even if I'm right, say I'm wrong. Because it's not worth your life. And because... And let me finish, and because, but not everybody can do that. Not everyone has that strength. Not everyone grows up with a mother and a father to set that example and to teach them that. So I can't say that everybody is going to be like me. But I have been stopped by police officers going to the gym 6, 5 a.m. in the morning. I have never had a problem with a police officer. Never in my life. And I get stopped. When we talk about a disproportionate amount of run-ins with young black men, do you think any of these encounters are spurred by racism? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. And I am, and let me just say this to you, it's just not white cops, it's black cops too. Let's talk about everybody. Okay, let me put a penny right there, we'll continue more right after the break. Please stay close. Have you been scammed with a beauty? We're talking today about uh, whether or not police officers view blacks with more suspicion than they do whites. Yes, sir. Okay, first of all, I have a comment for Arthur and Armstrong. First of all, I think that the worst fear of a Ignorant white man is an educated black man. Exactly. You know, you carry yourself when you got pulled over. Like you said, when you got pulled over, you handle yourself in the right manner. You know, because you're educated and you know what you're supposed to do. Just stay calm and let him do what he has to do. Because what he's trying to do is get you in a situation where you feel that you're up against a wall, so you fight back. Then he puts you in the cuffs and takes you away. I'm strong. Let, let's get into the issue of he, he, he touches on attitude and presentation 
Um, this is one of, one of your concerns. Well, you know, I think there's a new kind of racism that's permeating the country now. I think it's young and black. I think, and, it, and I think it's far, it's far less to do with, I think there are a lot of people in this country, black and white cops, who fear young black men. That's the image. Stereo, uh, the television perpetuates this. But then the other thing is, there are a lot of young black men out there committing crimes. And they blame racism. Their parents protect them. And every excuse is racism. So they take away from those. And, and what happens is what they do in, in crime racism, in crime wolf, those young men who talk today who have legitimate gripes are minimized. Cops don't take them seriously because you have so many other people using this excuse so much that it has been worn out. So not everybody who's crying racism has been discriminated against. Some of these kids are committing crimes and belong under the jail. Um, I have a comment from earlier. Um, it made this the lady sitting over here. She made it seem like that it's just white cops that are out there. Like she's pulling all the cops together and calling them white. That's how I feel. But there's not, there are minority cops. I mean, right now, that is what they're trying to recruit into the police system. And with you saying, I mean, it's white and black cops discriminating, I mean, I commend you greatly for saying that. Yes, ma'am. I feel that, uh, I want to make a comment to everyone, that th I feel that there's a lot of sensitivity uh, in this, and I think that because a person is black, he's a little bit more sensitive because he's black, and uh, that's no, wait, the reason. Wait, could you explain that more? No, I think that they're bringing this up is because they feel like they're black that, and they're very sensitive about it, and so they. But do you think they have a reason to feel that way? No, I don't. I feel uh, that reason. they should. They, because they maybe they fit the description, and our police officers are trying to protect us. Uh, not only blacks or Hispanics or whatever, but I feel that they're, they're really oversensitive and they're magnifying the whole situation. Can, can Which, yes, go ahead. Okay, first of all, now, I'm not racist myself. I grew up in an integrated neighborhood, and I didn't know what racism was until I got a little bit older. Now, one thing, when a cop calls you a pea brain, then is that not racism? And, you know, I'd like to expound on that. I, okay, well, we'll, yeah, we know, we'll, get in, we'll get into all these personal stories. And also, I want to I wanna say to our audience, we're going to find out which black celebrity was slapped by police and called the N-word. You'll find out that police aren't the only offenders. Maybe you've been doing it, too. Stay tuned. As we talk today about whether or not police view blacks with suspicion, watch this. Jazz musician Wenton Marsalis had his first run-in with police when he was just 15. Growing up in a small town in Louisiana, he got stopped heading home after a gig. He said, quote, this cop called me the N-word and slapped me upside the head. I wasn't doing anything. My next guest says that sometimes less obvious forms of bigotry can be even more damaging, and he says those happen every single day. I'd like you to welcome the author of Member of the Club, Reflections on Life in a Racially Polarized World, Lawrence Otis Graham. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you. you were trying to talk before the break, and I had to interrupt you. Go ahead. Sure. What I wanted to say is that the type of sensitivity that people refer to is one, it's not just an issue of police brutality, it's everyday situations of of, for instance, being followed in department stores, getting onto an elevator, and a, and a woman grabbing her purse away, or, or not being picked up by a taxi cab in midtown Manhattan. I'm a corporate lawyer, and when I get into my Jaguar to drive to my office, police officers and others don't see a corporate attorney going to work. They see a black man in a stolen car. So, unfortunately, what happens is... As, as, as one of the women on the panel mentioned earlier, that regardless of dress, regardless of behavior, it's just probable cause because of our, the color of our skin. So it, it's, it does not matter what our behavior is because we are challenged just by the fact that we're there. I get stopped in the best neighborhood. You talk about um, growing up and what input you got from your parents on how to make it in the world. Exactly, and it's, I'm embarrassed to admit that after, at age five, my brother and I, we grew up in a completely white, affluent neighborhood outside of New York City, and we were stopped at age five by a cop who, who had the siren on and the, and the lights blaring, saying, where did you kids steal that red wagon from? And they put the wagon in the back of the car and, and asked my brother, true. who was seven, and myself at age five to get into the car. Fortunately, my parents stopped and saw this. But my parents told us certain things when we started driving to always carry a tape recorder. And it sounds so outrageous that we would have to do this. They, they also told us 
certain techniques when we go into to, to stores not to browse. Always go directly in, ask for a receipt, ask for a bag. All these defensive techniques to make sure that we can never be accused of a crime. But now there's something wrong with a society where parents have to warn their children that they can't well, act like everybody else because right. they're right. under right. suspicion. Right. What, I want to make one other point. I don't think that anyone on this panel is saying that all police officers no. are blatant racists or bigots. I think that what we're saying is there's a, there's a lot of passive bigotry out there. People that think that they are open-minded, that because they've been conditioned to honestly believe that the cultural shorthand for black is dangerous, so therefore, they don't think to themselves, I want to harass this black person. Not all of them. Obviously, there are the Mark Furmans out there. But still, I think most people are, just have this knee-jerk reaction because of the passive bigotry that they've been conditioned passive to believe. Passive bigotry, yeah. It's like, check, check and yourself. You know what, check yourself. Right. As exactly. soon as we come back, are police as aggressive with whites as they are with blacks. Is there a double standard for describing whites or blacks who commit crimes? We'll get into that next. If you, are police as aggressive with white suspects as they are with blacks in terms of descriptions? Well, they, you get descriptions from witnesses and you hope you get a complete description and the description that you get, you put out. You get the best description you possibly can. I don't know how you'd, you would answer that. Situation. Well, for instance, if there was a, a white suspect, would you hear um, five foot ten, white male, red hair, blue eyes, well, freckles, sure. curly, shoulder length? And with a black man, what would you hear? If, if you got that information, you'd hear exactly the same thing. Exactly the same. I'm not sure. Is it? Is there? Is there any validity to people thinking obviously that that's not the case, Bob? Well, the difference is, and what, what Daryl says is, is, in, is in part very accurate to the extent that the description will go out with respect to race. The difference is the way the police respond. Unfortunately, the way the police will respond is if you have a white male, uh, six feet tall, who has robbed a bank, for example, the, the police generally are not going to stop whites driving cars in the neighborhood. If it's a black description that goes out, mm. they're going to stop blacks routinely. That's not true. What's wrong. That's true. Not true. Absolutely not true. If you've got, you got a description of a white who's driving a, spe a specific kind of car or any kind of car that even comes close to that, you're going to stop them. And you're going to find police officers. No, you're going to find police officers who are going to stop That's them. not the example. The example is not anyone driving a car or any indicia of suspicion other than race. When you have just a description of someone white who has committed a crime, for example, oh, Bob. then you stop people in a car when you had no description of the car. What's happening, unfortunately, around the country is that people who are black are being stopped routinely, and that's wrong. Got to break away. As I can, as I say thank you very much to our guests, thanks to all of you for watching, as always. Yes, sir. Uh, this is the Daryl Gates. You seem to think it's funny that um, all the black men are getting stopped and how that they're getting harassed by the police officers. Why do you think he thinks it's funny? He didn't say that. The way he um, is acting like he said they had nothing else to do except for stop black, black men. That's, <laughs> That's what not what I was saying. <laughs> That's not what I was saying at all. I was saying that uh, the police in Beverly Hills is a very heavily policed city. And police officers over there really concentrate on those, those kinds of situations where they believe they ought to stop people. And they do it much more frequently than we do in the city of Los Angeles, but don't have that many police officers. Now, first of all, Anaris, my heart goes out to you. I'm sorry for your son, but you did say something like you don't trust the cops anymore.